Glory be to Jesus Christ. This is Father Bo Nehachowski, and welcome to our first Faith Friday. Faith Fridays. This is an effort of both St. Stephen's Ukrainian Catholic Parish and St. Basil's Melkite Catholic Parish to try and grow in our faith. But it, of course, isn't limited just to our two parishes. Everyone is welcome on Fridays every second week to come and learn who we are as Byzantine Catholics. Now, this particular first session is going to talk about, as parishes and as people, how do we become holy? How do we become what God wants us to be? Over the last few weeks, we've heard a lot about Mother Teresa, who has now become St. Teresa of Calcutta. We're going to look at her life to see what we can learn about becoming a saint. And also, we're going to take a look at what it takes for the Catholic Church to proclaim someone to be a saint. So sit back and enjoy this video. Becoming a Saint The Story of Mother Teresa Becoming Saint Teresa of Calcutta No one is ever born a saint, nor is anyone born a nun. Agnes was her name when she was born to her parents Drana and Nicola. She was born in Macedonia, in the year 1910. As she grew up, she experienced many positive things in her family, which was a loving and caring family. However, at the age of eight, her father passed away, causing great grief amongst her and her mother. But the mother continued to teach how to live in a good and holy life. Agnes's mother, Drana, would often say, My child, never eat a single mouthful unless you are sharing it with others. Everyone who sat at their table was considered family. When Agnes was old enough, she went to a Catholic school run by nuns. Every year they would have a pilgrimage, at which she went to see the Black Madonna. Agnes thought, maybe I could be a nun. So in the year 1928, when she was 18 years old, Agnes went and joined the Sisters of Loreno in Dublin. It was there that she took the name Sister Mary Teresa after her favorite saint, Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Soon after, she went from Ireland to Calcutta to begin her novitiate. In Calcutta, she became a teacher much like those nuns who taught her. She loved teaching the children, and with time again, she took her final vows and became Mother Teresa, the principal and headmaster of their school. But God was not finished with her yet. One day as she was traveling across the countryside in a train, she received her call within a call. On September 10, 1946, she heard the voice of God telling her to leave the classroom and embrace the poor. She, of course, was quite shocked hearing this news. But she decided to obey the will of God. Having taken her vows, she went to her community and asked permission to leave to serve the poor, but they steadfastly refused. After much begging for over a year and a half, finally she was given permission to work with the poor. Working with the poor was her joy, although it was extremely difficult. Eventually, other sisters from the same community joined her in the good works with the poor. When there was a good number of them, they had to approach the Vatican for permission to serve the poor further. So they approached the now St. John Paul II and asked him to start a new congregation. He gave his thumbs up. The sisters took on new habits and became known as the Sisters of Charity. The Sisters of Charity 
did much work on the streets of Calcutta, but they also did work throughout the world, growing very quickly. They set up poor houses, orphanages, hospitals, places of dignified death, all over many different countries. In fact, by the time of her death, in 1997, she was had over 610 missions in 125 countries. Mother Teresa won countless awards for her humanitarian work, including the Nobel Peace Prize, the Jewel of India, and the Gold Medal from the Soviet Peace Committee. But she gave all the rewards of these humanitarian acts to the poor. On September 5, 1997, she died at the age of 87, and she was canonized on September 4, 2016. Her feast day is September 5th, and we know her as St. Teresa of Calcutta. So can we learn anything from the life of Mother Teresa? Well, we learn that it takes work to become a saint. It takes a lot of prayer and the ability to hear the Word of God and to respond to it. If we all listen closely and are in tune with God, we too can hear His call for us. But have you ever wondered, what does it take for the Catholic Church to be able to proclaim someone a saint? Well, I could tell you myself, but I found a great video made by one of my favorite websites, BustedHalo.com. This is a group of Roman Catholic priests who do a wonderful job explaining many things about the Catholic faith. So instead of me explaining things to you, I invite you to watch this next little video. Did you ever want to know how the Catholic Church declares someone a saint? You probably know that periodically the Catholic Church recognizes new holy men and women as its official saints. But what exactly are the steps to canonization, that is, being named a saint by the Catholic Church? The process has actually changed throughout history. In the first centuries, it was by acclamation of the community that sainthood was pronounced, sort of a spiritual popularity contest. But because the stories of some of the early saints' lives were later found to be exaggerated or even purely legend, this method eventually gave way to a more structured process. So in the Middle Ages, a new path to sainthood was prescribed, a set of rules we pretty much still use today. Here's what happens. First of all, and probably most obvious, a person has to have died in order to be considered an official saint in the church because we believe the saints are in heaven with God. So at some point after their death, some fan of the potential saint, like someone who knew them or a member of their religious community, asks their local bishop to begin the cause for canonization. Once the bishop agrees, the potential saint receives the title Servant of God. And a formal review is undertaken at the local level, guided by historians and theologians. Then the bishop may decide to send the cause to Rome. The Congregation for the Causes of Saints, an entire department at the Vatican devoted to this sainthood process, then determines if the person in question demonstrated heroic sanctity in their lifetime worthy of imitation. That is, did they live a life marked by virtuous actions, doing good works out of love of God and neighbor? If so, with the Pope's decree, they are declared venerable. Next, the search begins for proof that a miracle occurred through the person's intercession since they have died. Note that this is not a miracle that happened while they were alive, like cases where saints have reportedly levitated or experienced the wounds of Christ. In the eyes of the church, a miracle attributed to someone after their death is evidence that the person is indeed in heaven with God, interceding for us here on earth. Catholic belief is that it is actually God that performs the miracle. The potential saint is essentially being credited with an assist, like in hockey or basketball. The process of confirming that a miracle truly happened is exhaustive. Miracles for sainthood are not limited to medical cures, but in practice they almost always are. And a miraculous cure must meet three stringent criteria. It must be instantaneous, lasting, and unexplainable. Instantaneous, meaning that a person goes from very sick or terminally ill to healthy in a very short period of time, usually days. Lasting, meaning it was not a fluke or a brief remission, the cure needs to last for at least a year or more. 
and unexplainable, meaning that the person's return to health may not be even possibly attributed to any other course of treatment. To verify these criteria, doctors and scientific experts mm -hmm. scrutinize medical records and weigh in on the credibility of these claims. Mm -hmm. Even non-religious skeptics are invited to try to disprove the miracle. Hmm. On top of all that, there must be evidence that people prayed for the intercession of the would-be saint before the miraculous cure happened, and that they did not enlist the help of any other saint. It's okay to pray to God or Jesus directly, of course, but you can hedge your bets by also including ringers like St. Jude or even the Virgin Mary. So once there is proof that a miracle resulted from the aspiring saint's intercession, the person may now be officially called blessed. The ceremony during which this happens is called beatification and is most often held in the local diocese that has promoted this person's sainthood cause. At this point, a feast day is chosen to be celebrated in certain places having to do with this blessed person, and churches and schools may be named after them. And now the search begins for a second miracle that can be shown to have happened after the beatification, using the same stringent process just described. Once miracle number two is verified and approved by Rome, the person may then be officially canonized, which means that the Pope declares them a saint. This ceremony almost always happens at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and is presided over by the Pope himself. Once canonized, a saint is recognized by the Universal Church and their feast day may be celebrated all around the world. Now that's the official process. Of course, there are always exceptions. For instance, a martyr, someone who has died voluntarily as a witness to the faith, requires only one miracle for canonization, not two. The Pope can also decide to dispense with the second miracle even for a non-martyr, as Pope Francis did with Pope John XXIII. And then there's equivalent canonization, in which someone who is unofficially considered a saint in certain cultures or countries can be officially declared one through papal decree rather than through the full canonization process. It's important to note that the Catholic Church does not believe that through any of these processes a holy person becomes a saint. We are merely recognizing their sainthood. It's our earthly way of officially affirming that they are indeed in heaven with God, hearing and assisting with our prayers. And now you know how the Catholic Church officially goes about declaring someone a saint. Thanks for watching our video. We'll see you at the next Faith Friday.